The intense, tingling sensation that the man felt in his groin area quickly turned into a burning pain in his chest. He screamed as his mind went into chaos. A man standing 1 meter 90 and weighing 111 kilograms should have been bulletproof and not in terrible pain, he thought. And this was the last thought when he collapsed dead on top of the woman. Hey, that hurts you, big idiot, she screamed, trying to get him to move. It's not funny, Fred, and you lasted maybe 10 minutes. Fred, release. Penelope Mattern's lover, 29-year-old Fred Desmond, lay lifeless, heavy on her body, one of her arms pinned underneath him. She tried her best to squirm away from his weight, but he was too big for her. She tried to reach for her cell phone with her free hand, but her arm was too short to reach the device. She began to sob both from fear and disappointment. It became clear to her that today would not end well. Three hours later, most of Penny's body was half-conscious when she heard the back door of the house open and her children enter. She asked them to call 9 to 1 1 and not to go to the second floor. Maybe we should call Dad, too, asked her 15-year-old daughter. No! No! Penny quickly shouted back. Just call 911 and wait for them downstairs. Paramedics arrived at the house five minutes later. After making sure the kids were okay, they walked up the stairs to find Penny and her dead lover. Penny looked more guilty than a child with her hand in the proverbial cookie jar. The medics exchanged quick grins with each other, and Penny noticed. You probably won't believe this, but this isn't the first time we've seen this, ma'am, said the older of the two paramedics. Obviously, situations like this are very stressful, and heart attacks do happen. Yes, but he was only 29 years old, Penny said in a barely audible whisper. Then the autopsy should tell the coroner something interesting, said the junior paramedic. Turning the body over, both paramedics gasped. Fred Desmond was the handsome evening news anchor at the CBS affiliate in Lansing, Michigan. His star was rapidly rising, and it was known in some circles that he would soon be moving into the leadership chair in a major market. After the paramedics got the dead man onto a gurney and covered, they examined Penny as she lay under the man's weight for more than two hours. She appeared to be in good physical health, although she was advised to see a mental health professional. Lying under a corpse is the least of my problems, she said bashfully. Penny barely had time to put on a fluffy bathrobe when her husband Dan burst into the room out of breath from the quick climb up the stairs. Are you kidding me? He yelled at his wife when she stepped away from him. Both paramedics stood in front of the woman. Mr. Mattern, perhaps now is not the best time or place for this. Your children are below, said the senior paramedic. Dan rolled his eyes. His breathing was ragged, and both paramedics knew it wasn't from running up the stairs. In our own bed, Penny? Could it get any worse? Listen, Mr. Mattern, we can call the police in a few minutes if we feel that your wife needs protection from you, said the senior paramedic. I'm not going to hit her, although God knows she deserves it, Dan said. Both paramedics nodded in agreement. Penny caught these nods. Did the children call you? Penny asked as the paramedics carried the dead body out of the house. No, I talked to them, and it turns out you told them not to call me. Great. Fabulous. You asked the children to cover you. You suck. You know that? Janet called me from work in the next block when the ambulance arrived, Dan said. I think the whole district already knows what happened. Because the call was made on the police wave, within half an hour every news organization in Lansing knew about Fred Desmond's death. These newsrooms debated whether to downplay the death out of professional courtesy or make it more significant because of Desmond's prominence in Lansing society. Larry Richards immediately recognized the address where an ambulance was called when he was informed of the death of Fred Desmond. This was the home address of his mistress, Penny Mattern. He instantly understood what it meant and was shocked and hurt. He and Penny had an affair for just over a year. Without hesitation, he wrote to the woman, what the heck? Penny saw the text message on her phone, but at that moment she had more important things to worry about. Larry has been an anchor at the Lansing NBC affiliate for six years. He was respected in the community, 
Although his career lacked the juice that his rival at CBS had, he certainly enjoyed having sex with Penny and was shocked and angry that she apparently did it with his rival as well. Larry knew the station's news team would be debating how to handle Desmond's death. He called the news editor and expressed his opinion. We need to get tough on this story. The news editor was the only person at the station who knew that Larry was having fun with Penny Mattern and was not surprised by Larry's opinion. He agreed with him. Those bastards at CBS deserved to be ridiculed. The fact that they had better ratings than his team was only part of his decision. Yes, exactly, he admitted to himself. Penny herself was prominent in the Lansing community, serving as executive director of the city's highly respected arts guild. Two prominent personalities in society are a definite plus for news coverage, the news editor noted to himself. Get dressed, go downstairs, and figure out how to explain to our children what happened and why they will spend the next few days with your parents, Dan said. Don't be too frank, but don't try to downplay your mistake. The kids are old enough to know you screwed up big time. I will hear everything. Call your parents and tell them about this. And you might as well tell them the honest truth because I guess it'll all be on the evening news tonight. Penny's green eyes became wide as silver dollars. She hadn't thought about the news aspect of the story. With Dan present, Penny explained to the kids that she had cheated on their father earlier that day, in their own bed. The man she cheated with was popular news anchor Fred Desmond, and while they were having sex, for some unknown reason, Desmond died. So you had sex until you died, Mom? The couple's daughter, Ellie, asked quite sincerely. Wow! Penny blushed profusely. Dan made a face and walked into the family room. Dan waited until Penny and the kids went to her parents' house. He figured that 40 minutes round trip, plus another 20 to discuss with her parents, would give him an hour to do some important things, like finding a good lawyer and dividing up the finances. In his opinion, divorce was a given. Everyone knows someone who has been divorced. Dan knew a few himself. One of them was a good friend of his, at the national telecommunications firm where Dan worked. Among several others, he made this call. Penny returned about an hour and a half later, looking as if someone had repeatedly punched her in the stomach. Dan guessed that the conversation with Penny's parents had not gone too well. He knew that the Fitzmorrises were conservative and were probably more than a little upset about their daughter's infidelity and the fact that it had become public knowledge. Penny sank down onto the couch opposite Dan's chair with the lift-up footrest. Looking closer, he saw that she was crying a lot. Everything went as well as it should have if I expected that they were going to burn me at the stake, she moaned. I guess I deserve it. Dan looked at his wife impassively. She took this as a signal to continue. Sorry, Dan. I'm really sorry, she said. I'm sorry for cheating. I'm sorry for hurting you and for blowing up our family in the most public way. You should know that publicity was never part of my plans. Never. I have no idea what happened today. He was only 29 years old. Penny began to sob, hiding her face in her hands. Dan didn't move from his chair. She cried for a few minutes before looking up and seeing the emptiness in Dan's eyes. She had never seen such a look from her loving husband. How long did it last? Dan said calmly. Penny winced. I think we were together for about three months. We were together. Great term. It almost sounds like loved. So innocent. But I still prefer the word treason. It means exactly what it means, Dan said. He interviewed me for an article, she added. We were flirting, both of us. He was a big, handsome guy, a former college football player who kept himself in shape. We met for lunch several times and one thing after another. He was very good in bed. That's good to hear, Dan replied. Have you always had sex with him in our bed? She lowered her eyes. I suppose you know that he was married and had two small children. You left wonderful memories for them, Dan croaked. I don't want a divorce, Dan. Please, I will do everything that you want. Consultations if you like. Please, she whined. Why should I care what you want? Dan snapped. You had a three-month affair with this freak. 
You had fun with him in our bed. He died in our bed. It'll probably be all over the news tonight. Damn woman. My children and I will forever be ridiculed because you couldn't keep being a faithful wife. Fred Desmond's death from an apparent heart attack in bed with a woman who was not his wife became the top story on three of Lansing's four major television stations. Desmond's own station merely noted that the 29-year-old died of an apparent heart attack. That night, Dan moved into the guest room. He will never sleep in this bed again. Due to the negative publicity surrounding her affair with Desmond and his subsequent death, Penny was fired from her job. She knew the board had no other options if they wanted to maintain funding. Additionally, her longtime lover, Larry Richards, called her to end their relationship, calling her every name he could think of to, among other things, question her honesty. The following week, she was served at work. Dan sought full custody of his children and had written requests from them to stay with their father. He told the judge that although he could afford to pay the mortgage on the house, he and his children would move in the future because he expected the public would react very negatively to this. Penny returned home that evening looking depressed, but neither her husband nor her children tried to cheer her up. She has been ridiculed every day since news of Desmond's death broke. With everything going on in her life, Penny didn't pay much attention to the fact that she wasn't getting her regular period. The next time it happened, she also felt nauseous and realized she was pregnant. A home test confirmed this. Do you really hate me that much, God? She asked herself out loud in the bathroom. She waited until the family had eaten dinner before telling them, and she winced when, when she announced her pregnancy, Dan choked on his food. She knew he was thinking that the child might be his, in which case he would probably have to stay married to her. She would consider it luck, but Dan certainly wouldn't. I don't believe for a minute that this child is mine. We'll do a DNA test next month, Dan said, and Penny's hopeful expression disappeared. You do not trust me? She asked incredulously. Have you at least once recently shown me that I can trust you? He responded. Fred Desmond's widow was unhappy when Dan Mattern's lawyer called and asked to take her late husband's DNA to compare with the baby Penny was carrying. The lawyer explained to Mrs. Desmond that if the child really belonged to Fred, then child support would have to be paid from his inheritance. Dan Mattern was adamant and said that he would not pay child support for someone else's child. Maggie Desmond clearly understood what Dan was getting at, but she still wasn't happy about it. Testing was carried out over a three-month period. To everyone's surprise, neither Dan nor the late Fred were a DNA match. Really, Penny? Dan shouted at her when the test results came back. How many guys have you cheated on me with? Penny's lawyer had to secure a subpoena before Larry Richards gave what turned out to be a matching DNA sample of his. Needless to say, Mrs. Larry Richards was not very happy to learn that her husband was having sex with the number one slut in Lansing and would be paying for the privilege for the next 18 years or so. Penny's pregnancy with Larry made Dan's request to become guardian of his two children a win-win. I know I asked before, but how long has this affair been going on, Penny? Dan asked one evening when they were figuring out some details of the division of property. As if on cue, Penny blushed and asked for forgiveness again. What other news is there? Dan thought to himself. Larry and I have been lovers for over a year. We met once or twice every two weeks or so. You know, since I worked part-time, it was always pretty easy for me to take time off during the day. You worked all day and always trusted me completely. I aboost your trust so much, Dan. I'm so sorry, Penny said, but not so much as to stop or not have a second lover. God, Penny, two lovers. Am I really so bad in bed that you had to have two? Dan groaned. Penny saw the pain in Dan's eyes and knew full well that she was the cause of it. You're a great lover, Dan, she replied. You have nothing to do with it, but it's all about me. My weakness. I found Larry attractive, and this led to me having sex with him. And honestly, the sex was very good, but it was just entertainment, pleasure. It had nothing to do with love. 
and in my mind, I was able to separate it from what you and I have. After the first few times I stopped feeling guilty because I never took anything away from you. Whenever you wanted, I was always by your side. Dan wondered how his life could have veered so far off its current course. He met Penny at a party at Michigan State University when both were students. She was a short girl with small, perky breasts, long blonde hair, and bright green eyes. He was a tall, thin mathematician with curly brown hair and an easy smile. Before meeting, both had little sexual experience. One date eventually turned into marriage. The couple was compatible in every way, especially sexually. Especially before the birth of children, it seemed that nothing was inaccessible to them sexually. Penny had a big sexual appetite, and Dan made it his mission in life to try to give her as much as she wanted. As the marriage progressed and the children grew, sex slowed down and became more moderate. However, to keep the fun going, the couple held special date nights once a month. Dan has been thinking hard about his marriage over the past couple of years. Did he miss Penny when she said she needed more sex? Could she really love him and still have not one, but two affairs? How could she think this was acceptable and not related to their marriage? There's a lot to think about, but it doesn't change anything. 18-year marriage became another statistic. Dan's children fully understood their father's desire to move to another city. In the final weeks before the end of the school year, their classmates had been quite cruel in their comments. Social media has also been unkind. Although his children protested, Dan forced them to undergo several sessions with a psychologist recommended by his lawyer. For different reasons, they both liked 30-year-old Dr. Charlotte Puhaka. She's pretty cool for a psychologist, his daughter commented. Yes, and she doesn't look so bad, Dad, said his now grown-up son, raising his eyebrows. I'm paying good money for you to talk to her and not drool, Dan told his son. Dan only dropped off his children for the first session, so he only met Dr. Puhaka during the second session. He had to admit that his son had a good eye for beauty. Dr. Puaka appeared to be of Scandinavian descent with long blonde hair, deep blue eyes, alabaster skin, and long legs. Thor himself would have liked the appearance of the pretty doctor, Dan thought. Dan and the psychologist also had their own meeting within a few minutes of the session with the children. He agreed with her assessment that he, too, could use a few sessions. He knew he had serious trust issues and wasn't sure he'd ever be able to overcome them. Dan attended 12 sessions, the same number as his children. He hoped that the resilience of youth would allow his children to overcome any problems. They had much faster than he could overcome his, and he expressed this idea to a psychologist who told him that he could continue to visit her as needed. But if I'm your patient, we won't be able to date, he said with a grin. While that is true, you are making a rather serious assumption, the doctor said, and her manner was not unfriendly. Dan was in no hurry to make acquaintances, either with Dr. Puhaka or with anyone else, despite the fact that several female acquaintances made him aware of their interest. Even with alimony from Dan, half of the couple's assets, her half of the proceeds from the sale of the house and child support, Penny needed to find at least a part-time job after the birth of her second son to be able to support herself. She also moved, but tried to stay away from the city where her entire family now lives. She also took back her maiden name and began using her full legal name, calling herself Penelope Rhodes. She was proud that she had managed to lose weight during her pregnancy and was soon back to her pre-pregnancy weight. However, she did not start making acquaintances, although she had many chances. A 43-year-old single woman with a newborn baby and a part-time job, there was little time for a social life. She tried to keep in touch with Ellie and Robbie and gradually restored relations with her parents, who decided that they would not punish their third grandson for the sins of his mother. Dr. Charlotte Puhaka was surprised to see Dan Mattern calling her. She had not spoken to him for more than six months since the day his sessions with her as a patient ended. He expressed interest in meeting her in person, but did nothing and she assumed he had found another partner. Hello, Dan. I thought maybe you forgot my number, she said lightheartedly, giving him the opportunity to open the door. 
No, just gave us both a little time to forget about the doctor-patient relationship, and also to show you that this is not some kind of revenge, Dan said. Charlotte smiled to herself. It's not uncommon for patients of both genders to become attached to their therapists, especially men, but Dan seems to be different. Charlotte was very pleased because after listening to him during therapy, she decided that Dan was a person she would like to get to know better. It didn't hurt that she found him handsome and sexually attractive. Dan was pleasantly surprised when he picked up Charlotte the following Friday, asking her out on a date. She'd always been dressed professionally when I'd seen her before, but for the date she'd dressed much more casually and much sexier. A mid-thigh denim skirt, a tight white top that showed off about five centimeters of toned stomach, and sandals with seven and a half centimeter heels. He failed to feign indifference as he openly looked the woman up and down when she met him at the door. As far as I understand, she's dressed normally, she said carefree, walking past him to his car. Um, yes, Dan replied, chasing after her to open and hold the car door. Ooh, old school, manners. I like it, she purred. Then you can thank my mother when you meet her one day, he said. Charlotte smiled to herself. She's been on enough dates to appreciate the little gestures that most men don't do anymore, like opening doors. The restaurant was an upscaly barbecue joint that also featured products from a local distillery. When the waitress offered her a large bib, Charlotte felt a little stupid, but decided to accept it after looking around and noticing that many customers were wearing these accessories covered in barbecue sauce. Dan accepted it with gratitude. Having learned that Charlotte drinks alcoholic beverages, Dan ordered them both a tasting set of whiskey, as well as a glass of ice water. After warning his companion to take small sips of whiskey, Dan explained the type of whiskey contained in each glass and some of the tasting notes of each drink. The girl admitted that she was impressed by his knowledge of alcoholic beverages, as well as how well each of the samples goes with barbecue. So you are a drinker, she said cheerfully so that he would understand that she was joking. You are like an alcoholic sommelier. Guilty, he replied. Penny liked wine more. I prefer distilled alcoholic drinks. He hesitated and winced when mentioning his ex-wife, especially to his former therapist. Do not do that. Don't think about her, Charlotte said calmly. She was an important part of your life for 20 years. And it's natural that she is in your memories. Don't try to hold them in or feel guilty when they come up. Over time, they will fade, and you will make new memories with new people. Damn! I didn't think we'd have a consultation today, he joked. Nothing like that, she replied, playfully slapping his arm. When the meal was finished, Charlotte noticed that there were a few drops of barbecue sauce left on her bib. It really saved my blouse, she said, taking off her bib. It would be awkward to walk around all evening with barbecue sauce on her. Dan told Charlotte that after dinner they would go to a club with music. After the barbecue restaurant, she assumed the club would be country western. So she was surprised when they pulled up to a club known for jazz. Jazz? Hmm. I'd bet on the country. I thought we were going to dance the night away, she said. Dan chuckled again and shook his head. No country, no hip-hop, no gospel. Screaming guitars are always good. Blues is good. Jazz is good. I'm a person with clearly defined tastes, he said. Do I fit into your clearly expressed tastes? Charlotte asked, making air quotes as she spoke. Of course, he replied. At the end of the evening, Dan received a chaste kiss. He was surprised when he returned home and both children were waiting for him in the apartment kitchen. Good date, Dad? Ellie asked with a wide grin. Did you keep your hands to yourself and act like a gentleman? Bobby asked with the same grin. Give me a break, guys. This is my first date in more than 20 years. God, I have no practice at all, Dan said. Both children grinned at each other, then at their father. I'm not going to help you, Dad. You're on your own here, Ellie giggled. But we approve of your lady. We both think Dr. Puhaka is wonderful. Don't screw it up, Dad, Bobby said seriously. Dan and Charlotte were finishing up their fourth date in two months, sipping coffee and shots of Bailey's Irish cream in Charlotte's living room 
when Charlotte got a serious look on her face. Dan, would you like to meet one or two more women, if only for comparison? I think you're too focused on me, and you might miss out on someone you might really like, Charlotte said. What if I find someone I really like? He answered, and I'm definitely obsessed with you. Charlotte blushed and smiled. She took the coffee from Dan, pulled him towards her, and kissed him passionately. He answered her with an equally passionate kiss. She led him upstairs to her bedroom. When they got to the bedroom, Charlotte kissed Dan deeply, pushing his back against the bed and finally pushing him onto it. As she began to remove his clothes, he reached up and ran his hands over her blouse, eliciting a long groan. He took her clothes off as quickly as she took him off. Then he pulled her body towards him, causing them both to fall onto the bed. Dan hesitated for a moment, realizing that he hadn't made love to a woman in over a year. But he quickly forgot about it when Charlotte pressed her tongue into his mouth in a searing kiss. He reciprocated her feelings and slid down her body. Charlotte's brain was in overdrive, her vision flickering and explosions ringing in her ears. Returning to the ground, she realized that someone, no, it was her, screaming. She stopped as soon as she remembered how to do it. Hearing the woman scream, Dan began to continue with great enthusiasm. God, he missed this, more than he could have imagined. He didn't know when the screams stopped, but he was suddenly aware of the silence in the room as the woman's body stopped writhing. He heard her breathing, but when he raised his head, her eyes were closed. He didn't know if she was passed out or just relaxed. Shar, are you okay, baby? He whispered. Having received no answer, he asked again. He waited a few seconds before he heard her move. What was that? She asked in a trembling voice. Are you okay? Undoubtedly, it was amazing. Can we do this again? Oh, yeah. He was inspired, returning to caresses. For a moment, he tried to remember when Penny had been this hot to him. He paused for a moment, realizing what he was thinking, cleared his thoughts, and focused on Charlotte again. He swore to himself that he wouldn't make this mistake again. For several minutes, they kissed, giggled, and talked quietly. Remember when I asked if you wanted to date other women? Forget it. You are my. Sure, you're mine, said Charlotte. On their next outing, a day of golf and go-kart racing before dinner at a Mexican restaurant, the couple were joined by Dan's children. Ellie, Bobby, and Charlotte hit it off immediately. Dan smiled a lot as he listened to their conversation. The ten-year age difference between Dan and Charlotte was not even discussed. The couple made wedding plans a year in advance until the conversation turned to children. Dan said he thought he was too old for other children, but Charlotte wanted at least two. They compromised on two children. Happy wife, happy life, Dan thought to himself. Dan and Charlotte were sitting in their pediatrician's waiting room with their one-year-old daughter, awaiting their baby's first annual checkup, when a familiar face walked out of the office, followed by a little boy. Oh, Dan. Hi, Penny said, surprised. She looked at Charlotte and the baby. Hello, Penny. Long time no see. Is this your baby? The last time Dan and Penny were together in the same room was four years ago, during the signing of the divorce decree. He noticed that she still looked good despite a few new wrinkles on her face and about nine extra pounds. Penny noticed that there was some gray in Dan's hair, but he still looked about the same as before and didn't seem to have aged a day. Perhaps it had something to do with the smile on his face that seemed natural rather than forced. She wondered if the pretty blonde holding the child was the reason for this smile and his youth in general. This is my son, Will. He's five years old now, Penny said. And this is Genevieve, our daughter, Dan said. Penny, this is my wife, Charlotte. Char, this is my ex-wife, Penny. Both women looked at each other. Penny was still trying to come to terms with Dan having another child when she came to the conclusion that Charlotte was probably ten years younger than her and Dan. Charlotte stood up and extended her hand. Penny hesitated before taking the offered hand. It's very nice to finally meet you. The kids speak very highly of you, Penny said. Charlotte just nodded. Dan knew his wife was a sweet woman, 
but he wouldn't lie by saying the same thing to his ex-wife, because it wasn't true. At least in her presence, the only thing Ellie and Bobby ever talked about Penny was about her health. Dan told his children that while he didn't mind them continuing to love their mother, he didn't want to ever talk about her again. Both children understood and respected his request. She looks just like Bobby as a baby, Penny said, looking at the baby. Bobby seems like a very caring older brother. He's grown into a young man, Dan said, and Ellie is quite a young woman. They seem to be from what little I see these days, she said. She noticed Dan's gaze and quickly added, I don't blame them for not visiting us more often. I understand that they are busy, but I would still like to see them more often. I am their mother. Charlotte lowered her eyes, hoping the other woman wouldn't notice. She wasn't going to tell Penny that Ellie and Bobby had been calling her mom for the past two years. Dan felt that to relieve the awkwardness he needed to say something. Anything. I hope this is just an inspection. I hope you and your son are doing well, he said. Penny sensed hesitation when the topic of her son's name came up. Of course, Ellie and Bobby must have said something about Will from time to time. And of course, Dan had simply forgotten, she hoped to herself. Dan noticed how her eyes became misty and felt guilty. Honesty is the best policy. The kids and I don't talk about you at all, Dan admitted. You're their mother, and I'm glad you're present in their lives at the level they want, but at home, we don't talk about you. Almost never. You broke my heart, and I felt like I needed a break from you. Children understand this very well. I don't know anything about your life since we broke up. Wow, Penny said in a half whisper. We had 18 good years together, and you can just cut me out of your life, as if our marriage never happened. Like an amputation. It's cruel. You did what you did. Now I do what I need to do to live my life. I live on. I live in the present, not the past, Dan said. So like I said, I hope everything goes well for you. Penny took a step back as if Dan had hit her in response. It's one thing to be hated and quite another to be simply ignored. Yes, sort of, mostly, she finally answered. I work part-time in the library. Will goes to kindergarten. Occasionally, I go on dates. Not many men want to seriously date a 40-year-old woman with a small child. I understand. I'm guilty. I didn't mean for it to be like this, Dan said, visibly wincing. It was nice meeting you, Charlotte. Take care of him. He is a good man. One day I forgot about it and looked where it led. Penny took her son's hand and walked out of the waiting room. Dan smiled shyly at his wife. Understand, you don't need to say anything. Her antics had led her to this moment. It's not my problem. I won't lose a minute of sleep over her, Dan said. You know that I'm not your therapist 24 hours a day, Charlotte replied. Sometimes I'm just your wife, the mother of your child. Now kiss me and stop analyzing me. Just love. I can do this, he said affirmatively. Subscribe to our channel so that your second chaff doesn't cheat on you and go ahead and listen to the next story, because this story is nothing compared to the next one. If you're under 18, don't even think about listening to the next one.